Hello, Dr. Huggins. From the Hill Country in Texas, this is One Radio Network.com. Here we go, hour two of our show up to Colorado Springs. I believe that's where he hangs out with Dr. Hal Huggins. Dr. Huggins has been a dentist since 1962. Holy cow. That's a long time. And uh, he's written a whole bunch of books. I, th- I think he has 17 different ebooks on his website. Then you get a whole package there of ebooks. halhuggins.com. Dentist since 1962. Uh, he did uh, immunology, toxicology study, began in 1990. And he's a founder of the Multidiscipline Alliance. And he, with people who practice the Huggins Protocol, his latest book, Patient Empowerment, is now in paperback. Dr. Huggins, good morning. Good morning down south. Good morning up north. Is it Colorado Springs? It is Colorado Springs. And really? it is a beautiful morning today. Really? How are yep. you feeling, sir? I'm sorry? How are you feeling? Well, if I'd known you were going to ask that, I'd have taken blood pressure, pulse, and temperature. Well, you want to, you want to wait? We can do a commercial? <clears throat> I'm fine. I'm doing fine. Oh, yeah? You've been traveling a lot? Uh, not since the day before yesterday, but yes, I have. <laughs> I've <laughs> been traveling <laughs> quite a bit. Yeah, yeah. When you said that he lives in Colorado Springs, I thought, well, that's where he washes his socks. Yeah, that- <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Oh, I thought you had somebody to do that for you. We have to have a talk. Uh, if, uh, you like, if you'd like to be on the show, 888-663-6386. Email patrick at oneradionetwork.com. Boy, if I had one of those e-reader things, I would get one, I would get your library of e-books. Look at that. We have 17 e-books. Man, you, uh, chronic fatigue, candida, frequently asked questions, Gulf War syndrome, high blood pressure, you must be a doctor or something. How did you figure all this stuff out? <clears throat> well, did a lot of listening and watching. Yeah. Watch your patients, and you find out things that you don't find out in books. Yeah, yeah. So you still see patients there in Colorado Springs? No. no? Well, yeah, to a certain extent. You can't really call them patients, maybe clients. We have um, something we call a day with doc. Uh-huh. Um used to be, you know, we had these uh, 10-day programs before the ADA destroyed everything. And now we have something called Day with Doc in which <clears throat> I'm going to sit down and go over the chemistries with a patient from um, basically 9 till 4. Wow. I have a little bit of help from my uh, co-workers here. And then uh, we try to work in conjunction with the dentist as far as compatibility of materials and what sort of things should be used and what they won't get along with because there there are things every day patrick it seems that come up that give us problems and that's what this book patient empowerment i thought well i would just write a little book here that tells all the things that uh what they're doing that do some harm you know where does decay come from number one and what do sealants do and whiteners and <clears throat> all this kind of stuff. Well, by the time we got up to about <laughs> 16 or 18 items, I'd finished the book, and I still had 16 or 18 to go because I haven't covered... I covered root canals, but I did not cover implants and bone grafts and all that. So that's going to be in the next book. If anybody's interested in it, let me know, and I'll go ahead and write it. <laughs> got nothing else to do, right? Just write another book, Dr. Howlings. And, you know, I've written 18 books Is in the celestial realm in addition to those books. 18, 18, like, physical kind of books, right? Well, they, you know, they're paper, well... Yeah, paper and... in the computer right now, but... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, I have done a lot of writing, that's true. Well, some of the most, I guess, most fun things that people love to talk about at dinner are root canals. Right, you know, they say... Talk right. about that at dinner? <laughs> yeah, like, it's like one of the most... What do you have at dinner that I don't? Well, you know, I just, we're pretty weird around here. So, but let's start, let's start off with some of the work that you you just alluded to me on the phone the other day, that you've been doing some similar research. Dr. Uh, Nunley's been doing some research with looking into these root canals and seeing what you see down in there. Um, so you guys are finding a lot of 
What What are you finding when you look at these root canals? Surprises. Surprises. I mean, are you surprised? Yes. Really? All right. Now, in, in school, one of the things that was really uh, way out there, and boy, you were really something if you could do this, hmm. you had a tooth that's abscessed. All right, you look at the x-ray, it's a two-rooted lower molar, and one root is abscessed and the other one isn't. Yeah. Okay. You cut the tooth in half, and you cut out the infected root, and you leave the one that looks okay, and you put a crown on top of it, and you got a tooth there. Yeah, it sounds so good to me. I believed that for 50 years. Well, more than 50, because I was shown that in dental school. I've been out of school for 51 years, hmm. out of school and into learning. Now, I did have a very good school, um, <clears throat> but... When it comes to looking at what's going on in people, that's something else. Well, then, you know, I was given this uh, material by Weston Price uh, posthumously on root canals and just really startled me because uh, kind of a secret between you and me. I was pretty good at doing root canals. And uh, after spending 20 minutes reading some of the stuff that he had left in his legacy box back in 1947, given to me 40 years later, 20 minutes into that, I never did another root canal. It took me 20 minutes to learn what kind of problems were there. Well, the challenge from Price was find somebody who will pick up my work and carry it on because he had worked for 35 years in dentistry, still did root canals. Well, it took 15 years before I could add one sentence to his work. And it was because his work was put in a couple of big volumes, like 700 pages long, Hmm. so thorough and so complete. Every place, I mean, he knew what was going on with the patient. He knew their history. He knew the history of their family to see what was genetic. (laughs) They did uh, blood studies on the patients. Uh, They did microscopic evaluations on the root canals. Mm -hmm. They cultured them. They just did all kinds of stuff. Then he got together with Mayo's. You may have heard of the Mayo's Clinic. Yeah, that little place up north, yeah. Now, that was there even before I was, so it's been there a long, long time. And at the Mayo's Clinic, a fellow named uh, Rosenau had taken some uh, teeth out of patients who had, for instance, died of a heart attack and mm-hmm. or had a heart attack. And he took out a root canal tooth, stuck it under the skin of a rabbit, and in 10 days, the rabbit dies of a heart attack. Oh, great. Hmm. Hmm. So he tried that with diabetes. He tried that with all kinds of diseases. In fact, he ended up doing 11,000 rabbits. And uh, then he got in touch with (laughs) Weston Price because Price was um, head of research for the Dental Association at that time. So Price picked this up and expanded on what Mayo's had done, um, doing the same tests that they were doing plus more. And he found that he could transfer heart disease from the human to the rabbit 100% of the time. Now, what they would do, each test, each tooth, was put through 30 rabbits. <laughs> and if you did 30 rabbits, um, and 100% of them died of a heart attack from the same tooth being transferred from one to the other to the other, that pretty well said that there's something in a root canal that has to do with heart disease. Well... It took a bunch of years before our DNA laboratory was put together, and we began to find what was in these uh, teeth. There were pathological bacteria supposed to be sterile. Well, then the thing that one of the things that really blew my socks off was realizing what I had mentioned earlier. You know, you got a tooth where one t- root is infected and mm-hmm. the other one isn't. Mm-hmm. Well, we had one like this. And the tooth was extracted, and uh, I said, okay, let's go into the socket and take a little blood sample from the socket and see what is there uh, and look at the infected uh, socket. And don't worry about the one that's healthy. 
Well, the technician kind of had a mind of his own, so he did both of them. And the big surprise was where the infection showed on the x-ray, there was very little bacteria found on DNA. And where there was nothing showing, everything looked what they call a perfectly healthy root canal. On that root, it was teeming with bacteria. It had like 40 pathological, some of them lethal. Good grief, that thing looks sterile. What do you mean it's got all these bugs in it. So uh, we watched this for a while, and then uh, you mentioned Dr. Stuart Nunley. Mm -hmm. uh, he presented uh, 19 root canal teeth that, looking on the x-ray, they were perfect. Mm -hmm. Perfect root canal. Yeah. You take out something like that, and we're going to take away your license. You know, one of these malpractice things, you take that out. Well, He's smart enough to know that when people are sick, especially with neurological diseases and cancer and stuff like that, there may some, be something in that root canal that is creating the problem. Because in a root canal tooth, antibiotics cannot get into it, white blood cells can't get into it, so it becomes an incubator. So we've got all these 19 incubators, and we test them, and certainly every one of the 19 was uh, infected, and some of them, some of the bacteria showed up 100% of the time, some of the more dangerous ones, in all 19. But we had gobs and gobs of these bacteria that create disease. It just so happened these were all neurological patients, and every one of them responded after having the, responded positively after having the root canal tooth removed. Hmm. Dr. Huggins, um, each tooth is, is tied. In, is it energetically to different organs? Yes, if it you, is. If you look at that thing. It's, so I'm wondering about the rabbit thing um, and the heart disease. So do you know that when... when um, uh, Patrick, Western Price may I interrupt here and back up? I want to finish up something I didn't quite finish. Okay. Remember this question and come back I'll to I'll come it. back. Okay. Okay, so we've got a healthy-looking root that has lots of bacteria. we got uh, one that is a real mess uh, that doesn't have a whole lot of bacteria. Same why? tooth, same tooth, right? Yeah. Okay. Now, why is this? Well, it, <laughs> it took a minute to reflect on the fact that I had spent four years studying immunology when I was uh, practically a senior citizen. Uh, but what is happening here is where you have the root that has all kinds of action, the bone is dissolved and everything, you have war going on. You have the white blood cells, the immune system, in there fighting these bacteria, and, hey, there's collateral damage. Collateral damage is d dissolving the bone. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So that wasn't really creating a whole lot of problem because the immune system was keeping the disease process isolated around that tooth. Oh, okay. Now, that means the tooth hurts. Now, if we look at the other type where we have nothing around the root, that means the immune system has given up, is not doing anything there, so the toxins, instead of being stopped there, are pouring through the bloodstream into the rest of the body. Wow. And this is what you see on, quote, healthy root canals. The healthy root canal teeth are the ones that are giving you the most problem. The tooth does not hurt, but maybe your heart does, your lung, your brain, your liver, wherever the bacteria happen to set up housekeeping, that's where the problem is. And that was probably one of the most important things that I learned all wow. last year. That's fascinating. Yeah, so we get emails. Uh, as you know, I'm sure you get this all the time. Well, the, de the dentist, uh, the x-ray is clear. But it feels fine. He said it's good. I get those emails all the time. Do I need to get it taken out? And uh, Well, maybe you need to have a little reason to take it out. So with the DNA, we have a test that we started and then expanded and expanded. And now we find that we can take something called a paper point that is used in endodontics, in root canal work, and uh, we can take that and slip it under the gum tissue, two, three 
sixteenths of an inch. Doesn't hurt. Just slip it in there. Then have the patient bite down on a popsicle stick for 60 seconds, and the bacteria at the root tip come rushing up the root and jump onto this paper point, and we can find every bacteria on that paper point, on that sterile. It's like a little tiny toothpick made out of sterile paper, and we run that through DNA, and uh, <laughs> we look for 92 bacteria, and we can find any of them that are at the root tip, which, you know, every time you bite down, those bacteria are squirting from the root tip into your bloodstream. Well, <laughs> if you found that you had botulism and tetany, which we've seen recently here, and leprosy, and all kinds of stuff that you would have no idea would be hiding in the root canal, plus... Uh, we have found 24, 25, something like that, bacteria that are involved with the brain and nervous system diseases, and about almost 30 that are involved with heart valves, endocarditis, uh, with the heart disease. So if you've got two or three of these bacteria showing up, this may be why you have certain problems. Hmm. And if you've got eight or ten of these bacteria uh, as they say, are your affairs in order? <laughs> but you can find that out. And, you know, if you've got a whole gob of bugs there that say, well, we have one of a uh, famous movie star that was just run yesterday. And he has one problem, but he has no problem with his heart. But he's got 10 bacteria in, uh, in some implants, as a matter of fact. Mm. That um, are that specialize in giving you heart disease. Well, he doesn't have any problem with his heart, but with these people, sometimes the first symptom is a fatal heart attack. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think you've answered the rabbit question. So, so these there's particular bacteria that operate at a at a particular organ or organ systems. Yeah, they have uh, their own GPS system. <sighs> wow. So when they squirt out of the root canal into the ligament around it, into the bloodstream, uh, they're like bloodhounds. They've got a nose for the pancreas, for the liver, for the heart, for the brain. And uh, where does the bloodstream go? It goes to all of those goes places. goes to everywhere. So then the, then the location of the tooth would also have a bearing sometimes, right? A particular tooth which is tied in. To the, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So then you got that too, right, if you look at the... The little graph that, that well it's like with uh, uh breast cancer yeah uh you know i heard years ago that breast cancer comes from root canals on bicuspids I, yeah sure so the pathology the toxicity of this stuff is so much greater uh that it's going to overcome that uh meridian theory that, uh, you know, it can come from any tooth. Well, then you start looking at it, and, you know, some of the people had done this in Europe 40 years ago and kept 40 years' worth of records, and what do they find? 93% of the people with breast cancer have root canals on the bicuspids. Well, I started looking at the ones that were going through the laboratory here, and guess where the root canals are? On the bicuspid. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, there is, and uh, front teeth, there are four different systems of these meridians, but on the front teeth, this has a lot to do with the reproductive system. We've done a lot of work with infertility, and mercury has something to do with it, and root canals have even more. Hmm. And uh, if you've got root canals on the any of the four front teeth, upper or lower, uh, infertility is apt to be a problem. And there's... <laughs> If we can get a little personal on that. Yeah, the, we can get personal. It's all right. Okay. If you have a male who gets a root canal on a front tooth, the very front tooth, the two central incisors. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Oh, no, this is laterals, too. On any of the four front teeth, at age 18 or before, the testicle on the same side shrinks to half the size of the one on the other side. I hate it when that happens. And that has happened every time we've seen wow. that. Wow, wow. I mean, we're talking 100%. Wow. And with <laughs> females, the lateral incisor, which is the number two tooth from the center line, mm -hmm. uh, 
uh, root canals there are associated with a uh, lack of sexual climax in the female. Really? Huh. And you yank the tooth out, and it doesn't make any difference. But if you take the tooth out, take out the ligament, balance the chemistry on the way, then sexual activity comes back to normal again. And wouldn't it, isn't it interesting how it happens in the front teeth and we're all so vain that we don't want to get them pulled out because they'll say, well, what am I going to do? And I don't want to do an implant. I don't want to do a partial. So they leave them in. Yeah. 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 Do a root canal, keep it there, and put up with the consequences. Well, Dr. Hal Huggins is with us. We have more emails than we could probably do in three hours, but we're going to do what we can. They've been stacking up here the last two weeks, Dr. Huggins, so I hope you got your thinking cap on here. Patrick Timpone, OneRadioNetwork.com, Dr. Hal Huggins. So... I mean, the obvious question is, um, you finding things like leprosy and botulism and who knows what. What are some of the other spooky ones? Well, the, the heart disease, heart valves, yeah. uh, brain, brain problems, yeah. uh, meningitis. Well, there are about 200 different. Well, where do they all come from? They must be in the body already. Do we all have leprosy running around in there? Well, a lot more than you might think because in your territory in particular, Yeah. Uh, some of the people from down, right, way down south, the Mexicans come across the border, Yeah, they eat armadillo. They do. And armadillos are carriers of leprosy. I mean, you know, I thought leprosy went out with a crucifixion. Yeah, I thought so, too. I yeah. haven't heard anything about it in a long time. But we find about 20% of the root canals have leprosy in them. <laughs> and, well... Uh, Occasionally we find uh, anthrax. Where in the world would someone find anthrax? Yeah. Well, in the garden. I mean, some of these things we're just exposed to all the time, just don't know it. If you're a gardener and you're out there chewing around in the dirt and and uh, you get your hands dirty and you pick your nose or sneeze or something like that and put your hand to your mouth, uh, a few of these little bacteria can get into the saliva uh, that you can inhale them you inhale it, it goes into the bloodstream, and uh, our DNA is so super sensitive, we're cutting back on the sensitivity because um, we're picking up things way below what um, a disease would be. You know, one bacteria is not going to kill you. Now, when you get into the billions, yeah, now we got a problem. Mm -hmm. We're not looking at the singles. To start with, we tried to see how accurate we could be, and we did get down to being able to pick up one bacteria. Mm -hmm. And if you... you, And uh, they get in the bloodstream, and that's where they can come from. Uh Can we get you to speak up a little bit, Doc? Can we what? Oh. Get you there, yeah. I'm yeah, with, I'm sorry. I was leaning back, getting away from. The, yeah, yeah. I want to get you right on, right on the phone a minute. So, um, hmm, whew, uh, I just lost my train of thought when I asked you to get get back on the microphone. Doctor Hal <laughs> Huggins is with us, uh, OneRadioNetwork.com. So, how many root canals? If you're on a game show and you had to guess for a million dollars, what would you guess be? If how many root canals are done every day? Just say in the United States. Well, I hear figures. Okay. And uh, it seems from what I've heard that the Dental Association has put up a quota for root canals. The target is 30 million root canals a year. What? Now, they claim to be doing about 20, but the target is 30. Well, take 20 and divide it by 220, which is the normal year, and this will tell you how many. Uh, do you have a calculator there? I probably do. Yeah. Yeah, divide that out and see, but we're looking at uh, thousands of root canals an hour that are being done. And the question is, how many are actually contaminated? Well, you know, if you do 100 and you've got 100 out of 100 that are contaminated, that's 100%. But that's only 100. You ought to do uh, a few more, you know, maybe 500. Well, uh, if we lump the root canals and cavitations together, which we can mention cavitations later, uh, we've done 1,600 of them. And out of 1,600, still we have the three-digit 100% are contaminated with pathological bacteria. So there is no such thing as a sterile root canal tooth. 
Well, that, yeah, that's pretty pretty matter of fact. So the takeaway, of course, is don't get one. If you got one, get it out. Um, so let's. And then the question is, oh, but my dentist says there's nothing I can do except right. in an implant. Right. Well, implants are worse than root canals. You just don't like those, do you? Are you just not gonna? You're not gonna give way on those these implants, are you? Well, somebody asked me how I felt about these things the other day. Yeah. And it stuck, so I may say it again. Well, uh, amalgam is pretty bad. You know, it creates all kinds of problems, mental and physical problems, multiple sclerosis, leukemia. Yeah, we're working with some leukemias right now. Uh, Interesting, remind me to come back to this, but it was interesting. I was invited to the funeral last Saturday, and I didn't make it to the funeral. Uh, Neither did the patient. Oh, (laughs) <laughs> and uh, last night, uh, got a call from her son. They were setting up an IV vitamin C, and today they're getting a bunch of amalgams out. Uh, she had, She's had leukemia for one year, and he called to see if we could get some x-rays. And um, the dental assistant says, oh, yeah, I remember your mother. She was in about a year ago when we placed uh, several amalgams. And he just about went ballistic because that's when her leukemia started. Hmm. And, uh, you know, so amalgam, getting back to our original story, how do I feel about amalgam? Amalgam is pretty bad. What about root canals? Oh, they are terrible. They are really terrible. They're worse than uh, amalgam. What about implants? The word that, the only word I've come up with that describes my feelings is satanic. Wow, that bad. When you cross across the line to the only thing a person has to look forward to is suicide, you have messed with the soul. To me, you've crossed over the line. And, uh, you know, some people get along with them for a while. But let's connect the dots. When you put in an implant, you know, they rattle a little bit, so you pack cadaver bone around the implant. Okay, we got that? Yeah. All right, where does the cadaver bone come from? Cadaver. From a cadaver. All right, let's go back to 09. Uh, let's go back to 1909 at Mayo's. What were they doing? They were taking a root canal tooth and planting it in an animal. The animal died. All right, if you take cadaver bone from a human and, put it, and implant that into another human, you are offering that human the opportunity to become a cadaver. Got it. Gotcha. Gotcha. So, um, you just... When they get sick, they get miserably sick. I mean, they have miserable lives. I mean, if I ever got in a situation like that, please, please hand me a loaded forty-five. (laughs) So, you, you stick these implants in no matter what kind of material, and, Doc, what, the immune system is just not happy with this? Yeah, it is a foreign body. The uh, the human body, all of our, almost all of our body, red blood cells don't have them, almost all the cells in our body have a license plate. And the immune system looks to see if you've got the proper license plate on each cell three times a day. Implant material does not have your license plate on it. So the body launches an autoimmune response against it. Very simple. Simple as that. It doesn't belong there. So as my professor in immunology told me, anything, which is the important word, anything implanted in bone will create an autoimmune disease. The only difference is the length of time. So that would be all the four folks that have to do like hip and knees and all that stuff. Same thing? Afraid so. Yeah, boy. What a challenge there, huh? But whether it's stainless steel or uh, titanium or whatever they want to put in, it really doesn't matter. It's something that doesn't belong there. Hmm. So much for the bionic man. (laughs) Yeah, he's not on television anymore. Is <laughs> no, he's not. He's not. <laughs> so that that will take us to the next portion. What we're going to talk about 
is how do you stop these teeth from going bad so you don't even have to get in this position? And Dr. Huggins work with uh, blood work and trying to figure out the right kind of diet and so things don't go south so we can prevent having to think, oh, man, I can't do a root, I can't get, you know, so you don't have to get a root canal. So we're going to do a couple commercials, and then we're going to go there. Then we promise we're going to get to as many emails as we can, and we'll see just how much patience Dr. Helgens has with us and how long he'll stick around. So stay right there. Previously with Brandon on organic Shizandra containing the five tastes. Bitter, sour, sweet, pungent, and salty. It's similar to the emotions that we were talking about last hour, you know, Uh how like worry or pensiveness affected the spleen, like you were mentioning. Every taste affects one of the five organ systems, five yin organ systems, or one of the five elements. In Chinese medicine, you can basically condense all energy in the universe down to five elements, which is fire, earth, metal, water, wood. Because everything's interconnected, everything can just be distilled down into these five elements. So all five flavors, as they enter into your body, start sending signals to your organ systems to basically create a response or an effect. The vibration or the information in the Shizandra. Right, and that's why it's really key to have uh, an energetically vital product that has all those five flavors and all the tastes. Yes, indeed. They go through great lengths to get this Shizandra to you, an amazing quality. Click and order right on the front page, Organic Shizandra, OneRadioNetwork.com. A listener asked Stephen Hewer of One World Way, what about radioactive particles that may be floating around? The body can detoxify itself of the radioactive particles if it's producing glutathione, which means that if you're taking away protein, your richest source of the amino acid called cysteine that is needed to produce the glutathione in your body is found in this way. It's, there's no other way protein that's going to give you more bioavailable cysteine because they're all heat processed, which is destroyed and denatured the, the cysteine molecule. So you're taking a food that will increase your glutathione and thus protect you from radioactive fallout such that if you're exposed to it, your body's more capable of either preventing free radical damage and or neutralizing the incoming element to be excreted through the bile. And glutathione is what represents 60% of your phase two liver detoxification, and it represents the largest percentage of the cell's ability to detoxify and neutralize free radicals. That's interesting. Other people have told us the body must make glutathione, and it makes it from cysteine available in raw, grass-fed, one world way. Click and order. Front page, one radio network. Dot com. Well, it's funny. I've been, we've been called free radicals around here, One Radio Network. I don't want to be those guys. Hey, uh, Nadine Artemis of Living Libations. I believe she talked to Dr. Huggins part of their... She did this dental thing some time ago and whole dental... Pff, she's got some really interesting ideas and really cool products about gums and Yogi Tooth Serum and um, she's really into k- taking care of the teeth. Has some very good information and some very cool little products too that you might play around with. And you can click and order through oneradionetwork.com living libations. You see the nice little ad there. And so if you want to keep your teeth nice and happy snappy, well, that's somebody you can uh, kind of look at. And uh, living libations on oneradionetwork.com. We are listener supported. One Radio Network. Talk to Patrick now, 888-663-6386, or email patrick at oneradionetwork.com. With Dr. Hal Huggins, and he's been at this dentistry thing for about 50 years or so. And kind of on the Orso side. Or the Orso side. Well, it's great that they haven't, they've not caught up with you yet, so it's good. You know, it's, uh, it's something... You know, I was talking about this uh, Patient Empowerment, Volume 1, and mm-hmm. Volume 2 is still in my head. Um, if it was possible, if you didn't have 20 million of them, uh, to forward some of those emails to me, um, then that would give me an idea of what is it that people want to know that I could put in the next book. Oh, good. I'll forward them all to you after we... Yeah, yeah, sure, no problem. Yeah, yeah you know what they... Have people, okay, so obviously we don't want to get a root canal. We don't want to get uh, teeth that go rotten and all this stuff. We don't want to get gum disease. So much of your work is done with preventing these things, working with folks trying to find their 
their ancestral diet. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay, and you do that through um, voodoo. No, you do that through <laughs> <laughs> you do that through blood, blood work, blood, and, and hair analysis, or just blood. Uh, blood chemistry, hair analysis, the CBC, which is the cells in the blood, the mm. red cells and white cells, mm-hmm. and sometimes we get into porphyrins, and oh, there are about 60 different chemistries that I've looked into. But the, the basic is just the blood chemistry, the CBC, and hair analysis, because hair analysis, you know, a lot of people say, oh, that's just dead tissue. Right, right, right. Uh, I found that the hair analysis is reflective of what's going on within the cell, and the blood chemistry is what is available to the cell. Now, I was taught, well, I was... Say that again, say that again. I want to make sure I got that. Can you repeat that about... Yeah. Okay. That um, The hair... I was, let me put it another way. I was taught that the blood chemistry is reflective of what's going on in your body. Right. Yes, it's reflective of what's going wrong and right in your body. Mm -hmm. Hair analysis gives an indication of what's going on inside the cell because we are electrical mechanisms and our electrons are transported by minerals. So what you've got in the minerals, you know, minerals are the key. If you don't have the key, you're not moving the car very far. So the hair analysis gives you the keys that are moving um, the chemistry. Well, the blood is smart enough to be able to be a corrective mechanism. So if you have a cell that is deficient in something, the blood chemistry supplying that is going to shoot way up to try to force things through the cell, the cell wall, cell membrane, is not up to par because maybe it's got an atom of mercury or copper or nickel or aluminum, some dental material, on it that slows down its ability to get things in and out so the blood compensates by going very high so it can push, Hmm. force things in. And the opposite is also true. If the cell is contaminated with something, uh, like calcium, everybody has to take calcium. Well, most of the calcium is in a non-biological form. So it accumulates in the body, and where it accumulates, it stops function. So you've got a high calcium here. What does the blood do? It drops as low as it can to siphon off the high calcium. So you look at uh, blood chemistry that shows a low calcium. Oh, you got to take calcium. So you pour in more calcium. What does the blood do? It goes lower. Why? Because now we've got an even increase in the saturation of the stuff that doesn't work. So the, if you see the blood chemistry and the hair analysis, you have an idea of what's going on in the body. If you have just a blood chemistry... You don't know, because what if you do have a calcium deficiency? If you have a calcium deficiency, the hair will be low, the blood will be low. Yes, you are calcium deficient. Gotcha. The opposites can also occur. So you really kind of have to see both in order to know what is going on in that patient. In general, this could be too general a question, but in general, if you just have a little bit of mercury on a hair analysis, just a little bit, is that generally a good sign where, he's, where you can see that the mercury maybe is moving out? No. No? No, that's not good. That's not a right. Oh, that's, uh, that's one of the things that caught me up back 40 years ago when we were first working with it, that things didn't make sense. Well, they didn't make sense because mercury behaves differently from most of the minerals. When you have a low mercury in the hair analysis mm. or in the urine, Mm-hmm. What this indicates is a lack of ability to excrete. So I coined the term retention toxicity. You are toxic because you are retaining it. You're taking in two ounces, two grams, two parts per million, whatever. You're taking in two units of mercury a day and getting rid of one. Therefore, the other one becomes an accumulation, and you're becoming toxic. So a high mercury level... High, high uh, level means one of two things. Yeah. 
a high level means either you really know how to excrete it or, or you are exposed to it on a daily, weekly, monthly basis. Well, aren't we all just breathing the air, Doc? Aren't we all just doing what? Breathing the air exposed to mercury? Well, yes, mm-hmm. but we're also eating fish that is high in mercury. We're also eating the mercury that comes off of our fillings. And there are a whole lot of places you would never expect to find it. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. And after, here's a, a real clue, after you get your fillings removed, you become hypersensitive to the exposure. Your immune system says, hey, you exposed me to mercury once and made me sick, and you exposed me to even a little bit of it, and I'm going to make you sorry. And so you super overreact as a protective mechanism. Well, there's one place much of the recycled paper has mercury in it because it probably has some bacteria. And the place that we get a huge exposure is, if you can believe this, toilet paper yeah. that's made from recycled paper because that's a, where that's used is a very highly absorptive area. And the people, after they've had their amalgams removed, suddenly find that parts of their body are getting to be real sensitive if they use the toilet paper that has mercury in it. And the only one I know that does not have mercury is Charmin. I know. That just knocks me out every time you say that. It's got, come on. This is like the most commercial paper right ever on the market, and you say that that's the only one that you found that doesn't have mercury. Well, I haven't looked at that many of them, but I know it doesn't, so I stopped using it. So I'm going to start with Charmin again. That's so hilarious. So you mean this natural, expensive, recycled toilet paper we get at Whole Foods or natural food stores probably has mercury in it? It could be. If it's from recycled paper, if it's from recycled it has paper. Mer- and there was a patient that uh, huh. was very, very, you know, some people just make a religion out of this. Mm-hmm. And uh, he was one of them. He was doing absolutely everything we told him. But his uh, rear end broke out with uh, with red rash. And uh, he couldn't figure out why. Well, red rashes, to me, uh, look at mercury re. And I said, can I get kind of personal here? <laughs> uh, you work downtown in a tall building, right? Yes. Uh, You probably don't have a bowel movement until 10 or 11 o'clock in the morning. How do you know that? I said, well, I've put two and two together. That as afraid of bacteria as you are, you go into the men's room, you take one of those pieces of paper that fits a toilet seat, and you sit on that. Yeah, that's right. (laughs) That paper you're sitting on is saturated with mercury. And sure enough, the shape of the red rash on his rear end (laughs) was the exact shape as the toilet seat. So sure enough, he quit using that, and the rash went away. Dr. Hal Huggins is with us. So, Dr. Huggins, you've looked at lots and lots and lots of blood tests over the years, and I think uh, last time... I think the number is like 300,000 data points, which meaning 300,000 of these little like sodiums or platelets or whatever, right? Yeah. Uh-huh. Um, so so you've, with this work, you've kind of figured out what is a good number for these blood tests to be, whether it be sodium or cholesterol. Is that correct? That's right. And I call that the stability range rather than the normal range. Mm-hmm. Because by definition, normal is a mathematical term. Uh, For those who went through calculus, which I didn't, um, it is two standard deviations from the mean. Well, what in the world does that mean in English? That means it's about 95.56% of the population. Yeah. So if 95% of the people are here, that's normal. Is that good health? It has nothing to do with good health, and yet we are informed, oh, don't worry about it, your chemistries are normal. Well, normal is something that is established by each hospital, each laboratory. They take the last 100 patients that they've seen where they got the blood before they died and uh, put it all together, mix it up, and figure out what, leave off the top and bottom 2.5%, and what you got left is normal. 
And every disease I've ever heard of it occurs within the, quote, normal range. But if you look at people who have no root canals, no implants, no amalgams, no uh, aluminum-containing composites, of course most of them do now, and they're on their ancestral diet, they all come to the same point or the same very narrow range. And it doesn't matter whether they are red, red or yellow, black or white, they come to the same point. Occasionally it is a stability point. But uh, most of the time there's a very narrow range there, and that's our target. That's your target, yeah. Uh, you mentioned cholesterol. All yeah. right, are the range for healthy people, this has nothing to do with the ra- advertising, which is pretty <laughs> close to 100% fraudulent. It's advertising for cholesterol lowering drugs is a, uh, it's a financial thing, doesn't have anything to do with health. Because the healthy people are found, their cholesterol is found between 200 and 240. Mm-hmm. Now, if you, the point is 222, and it's been that for more than 50 years, because Melvin Page taught me that back in the 1960s, and he had already been looking at that for 30, 40 years before then. All right. Why is cholesterol important? The thing they don't tell you on television is, your hormones are made out of cholesterol. So, you know, you take cholesterol, add one little fragment over here, and you got estrogen. You move it over someplace else, you got testosterone. Do you need those hormones? Yes, you do. Everybody's talking about hormone replacement now. Well, get some cholesterol in, and you can manufacture your own. And number the really important is Cholesterol is the number two best detoxifier in the body. So if you look at the scientific literature, for some reason or other, they have picked 160 as the dividing point. If you are below 160 in scientific research, you have already come to the edge of low cholesterol and dropped off the edge. And the lower the cholesterol, the more chance of disease and you get down 130, 120, and that's where cancer survives. So if you, and heart disease, same thing. Now, we take pains to get the cholesterol down. How do you do that? You destroy part of the liver. That's what the drugs do, so that it does not produce the, the cholesterol. So your toxicity level goes up. Your ability to detoxify goes down. Uh, you're, what is it, something like a third of the brain is made out of cholesterol. Well, you don't need a brain anyway. You know, you've got a bigger brain than what is necessary. Sure, sure, no problem. That's a driver's test. So, so, this, so the statins, Doc, actually destroy part of the liver, the statin drugs, so the cholesterol number goes down? Yeah. Wow. It destroys the manufacturing process. There are bunches of books out now. Sure. Uh, <clears throat> that are real good. One of them, a uh, friend of mine went to the moon the other day and had a heart attack on the way back. In fact, you probably don't believe that. I don't, you know, I, no, no, I'm not believing that, but it's okay, go ahead. Yeah, okay, this was Jim Irwin who was on Apollo 15. Uh-huh. Two of them coming back, two out of the three had heart attacks, which you saw on the front page of the newspaper, didn't you? I think. No, you didn't. No, I know. Because it was kept quiet, but I have uh, worked with him. We've, uh, the things that we did there, he presented to NASA, and you don't go in space with amalgam in your mouth anymore. Uh-huh. You don't go in a submarine for extended duty with amalgam in your mouth. What was it in space or uh, uh, that, that uh, triggered the mercury to do weird things? Well, not only that, but when they would come in out, off the moon, you know, it's kind of hot up there. It's 250 degrees, and um, they're in a special type of suit. When they'd come in, they'd take off their boots and pour a quart of sweat out of each boot. Wow. But they replaced those precious electrolytes with tang. Tang, <laughs> yeah, well. So that's the people who've come back from the moon back in the early days. None of them have really experienced very good health. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, of course, when folks, uh, guys mostly, 
they have a heart attack and they go in and they give them stints and they do this and they bypasses or they wrote a rooter them out and they find this cholesterol and calcium. And then the docs say, well, it's found at the scene of the crime, so it's the perpetrator. And they still believe this, of course, most docs. Um, what is the calcium and the cholesterol doing there? Well, how much is there? Cholesterol is dangerous. It's real bad. So you'd expect it to be, what, at least 51% of the deposits in the artery. So if we analyze the deposits in the artery, we find that total fat is 1.5%. Really? Cholesterol is only 0.5%. So is 0.5% what's causing the problem? Well, let's look at calcium. How much calcium is there? 90%. Can you get oxygen through calcium? Can you get nutrients through calcium? No. What's the calcium doing there? Preventing nutrients from getting into the body from the vascular system and giving you what's called hardening of the arteries. When uh, I was in dental school, we had a year and a half getting acquainted with a dead body, and we (laughs) dissected it. And, you know, after you've been with a dead body, um, three days a week for a year, you get kind of loony, and you start doing funny things. Well, my funny thing was I would take part of Gerard's artery, that's the name I gave him, mm-hmm. in the neck, and I'd go up behind somebody and come close to their ear and uh, break that like you would a piece of spaghetti, and it would go pop, and it, it had a real loud ping to it. Wow. And uh, I'd say, now look at this, and you look at the cross-section where it had broken, and there was a little bitty hole in the middle, which is the only place the blood could run, and the rest of this was a whole gob of calcium. And when you'd bend it fast, it would break with a ping, so it was metallic calcium. Where was the cholesterol? You didn't see any cholesterol in that. So where did this uh, start from? It started from the idea of how can we make some money off of it. Yeah, the whole Framingham thing was a frame-up, I think. Well, Framingham did uh, study everything under the sun, and the Framingham study says whatever you do, do not lower the cholesterol in anybody over 50 years old. Yeah, well, that that didn't come out in the in in the in the real world. It was all about. Fat was bad after Framingham. Well, it went into other things, but it did not come. They said the Framingham study was done, and uh, Charlie over here in the, next, in the next city came up with this result. They used the word, but they did not quote exactly what was done there. Framingham was a good study. I've read a lot of that. And uh, what they are quoting has nothing to do Uh. with those studies. If you look at the studies that have been published on cholesterol, and I've got a gub of them, we've got a whole, you were talking about our e-books or whatever, Mm -hmm. we've got a whole two-hour thing on cholesterol. Mm. And that's skinny down from the three-and-a-half hour that I uh, (laughs) put together on a DVD in the first place, but it was just too much of the same thing. Mm -hmm. And it does show what's in the scientific literature and in the medical literature and the cardiovascular literature, and that's not what you hear on television ads. You hear the truth from these uh, from these scientific articles. So, Doctor Halgens, then, in simplistic terms, the calcium's going in there to try to do something, or the cal or the cholesterol to try to repair or yeah, keep it all happy, but. Um, talk a little bit about what you believe, what your research shows of why this inflammation starts in the arteries. Um, I I guess it could be a combination of diet, of infections, of the root canal. It could be a lot of different things, why why these arteries get inflamed or tears and the body tries to repair it. Yeah, you're absolutely right. You you hit it. No point in my talking about it. No, no. Well, well, I mean, that's just what I've been told. But is that what your understanding is? Yeah, I mean, there are twenty some bacteria in the root canal that like to go in and chew uh, on the inner lining. Uh, it's called endocarditis. Endo inside. Mm. Cardi the the heart inside the heart inside the vessels. These bacteria scar it up chew it up. And uh, cholesterol is one thing that tries to repair it, but calcium is what you can use as a Mm Band-Aid. So you don't want to have a rupture there, so you put some Band-Aids all over the place. 
And if there's no dental disease, what are some of the other reasons why this, these arteries get inflamed to start this process? Uh, meningitis is something that happens a lot. There is a, a oh, I've forgotten, what's that disease? Uh, Alzheimer's. Alzheimer's, yeah. I've, yeah, I'm forgetting that one. <laughs> um, Alzheimer's is related here, uh, especially tremors. You get low cholesterol, you get on statin drugs, and you just look and see who's got the tremors and who doesn't. Hmm. And, of course, you see dentists uh, are number one in heart attack, heart disease, death from heart disease, but they also get the tremors quite a bit, and they get emotional problems where uh, they can't talk straight to you. They get uh, real hyper angry. And... um, Okay. Uh, on the, you know, we, we know about syndrome X or metabolic syndrome with too many carbs, too much sugar that causes heart disease. It happens to a lot of vegetarians, right? Because they, they become doughboys. Can you describe the process of how the arteries can get inflamed and that calcium and cholesterol want to go in there to fix if it's, say, the person's got nice dental, no problems, but just eating too much bread, cookies, cakes, crackers, modern American diet? What's happening there? You've got to have some repair mechanisms, and our body is made out of protein. And if we don't have the protein in there, then we're not going to be able to heal. And here we go stepping on toes because, you know, this is just something I observed. I found that I could not balance the chemistry of a vegetarian. And they talked to me about, well, we've got the same amino acids, and the body comes in, assemble them, and you come out with the same thing. I mean, look at a cow. A cow eats grass and turns into muscle. Hmm. Well, a cow has five stomachs. We have one. They have certain enzymes that we don't. They can eat corn on the cob. I mean, they eat the cellulose, the cob itself, and they can convert this into protein. We can't. And it took many years before I finally found the head of pharmacy at the University of Colorado who said, well, sure, that's simple. I said, if it's simple, I would have found out about it 10 years ago. He said, the stereoisometric form is different. I said, well, well, the what? The what? The (laughs) third dimensional shape of animal protein and vegetable protein are not the same. He said, it's like having the key to... Uh, a hotel room and uh, having the key to the room next to you, they both go in the lock, but there's only one that's going to open it. That there is a small difference in the third dimensional shape, so it'll go in. But, you know, they live a perfectly normal life. Unless they become mercury toxic or become ill, then there's nothing I can do for them because I don't have the protein. Uh, We had a situation just recently i i tell people hey if you're a vegetarian don't come see me because i have no reason to steal from you you pay me i'm not going to give you anything in return that's not exactly true i might be able to improve the health 20 percent but not what i would like to do well there was one gal who just last month talked me into accepting her as a patient okay so we went through and examined the nutritional parts and so on, and and she had some root canals. I said, okay, the root canals are going to come out um, by somebody who knows what they're doing. You'll have the IVs. You'll have all the necessary things we found over the years, but you're going to bleed for three days. No, 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 I know how to take care of that. Don't worry about it. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll take care of it. Well, next day she calls. She's still bleeding. And the... Gal who answered the telephone couldn't help but laugh. Said, "Isn't that what Huggins guaranteed?" Well, it shouldn't be doing this. Well, in a vegetarian, it does. Next day, she's still bleeding. Next day, she's still bleeding. And we had a couple one time, several years ago, who went through one of the programs, and uh, she had her uh, root canals removed. And she said, "Well, we will eat eggs for three weeks before we come in." Well, okay. So she bled for a day and a half and quit. Uh, She was, I think she was eating two eggs a day. Well, the husband was about three days behind her. He started eating five eggs a day. (laughs) And uh, after one day, he did quit bleeding. But, you know, there is a religious aspect. Some people do not eat protein for religious. Uh, Some people don't want to kill animals. Well, I don't care what it's from. Just don't ask me to balance the chemistry 
where I can't do it, and I can't do it on a vegetarian diet. Now, how much protein do you need? The blood, no, the stories are written in blood. That's the title of one of my DVs on interpretation of uh, chemistry. And, like and teaching, what blood marker tells us if you have the, how much the right amount of protein? If people have done a blood test recently, can they look? Uh, let's see. It's got a special name. Oh, the name is Total Protein. Oh, Total Protein. Yeah, you know, I, I just, I'm in Dripping Springs, so excuse me. Uh, total Protein. Let me look on my cheat sheet and see if I know what your favorite number is. I used to know that. Total Protein number, Dr. Hal Huggins. Okay, you may have to tell me because I can't find it. On, oh, no, it's your favorite number, 7.0, right? Yes. Okay. And uh, there's a if that goes with it. Oh. If the albumin is 4.6 and the globulin is 2.4, then you're in perfect shape to handle everything, every type of attack with the best of your body's genetic ability. Oh. So the total is one thing, but the division of those two is another. So you, Melvin Page and you over the years have just figured this kind of stuff out. Well, uh, Melvin Page used about six or eight chemistries. I've expanded that quite a bit since then, but protein is one that uh, was, he came up with those figures, he came up with the cholesterol figures, and uh, I find he was right on target. Now, some people, to maintain the proper protein, uh, when I was younger, it took about uh, 14 to 16 ounces of protein a day to maintain that. Now I can do it on maybe 12 or 14 ounces. Some people can maintain the, exactly the same chemistry on two ounces a day. So how much do I need? Two, three, five, ten? Uh, your chemistry knows the answer. Mm -hmm. And then what happens in the body? Um, what doesn't happen? I guess a better phrase, Dr. Hal Huggins. What doesn't happen in the body when those proteins, globulin, and the, what was the other one? Um, are, are low, what's what's not happening? Albumum, what's not so, happening? Uh, what is happening is you're going to end up with dental decay, oh. which is indicative of the total health of the body. Gotcha. So mm. the, the barometer of the body's health. Mm. But, the I mean, aren't there, aren't there vegetarians that have good teeth? Yeah. Yeah? How do they do that? I don't know. Oh. Well, there are several things, too. Um... <laughs> I used to be married to uh, uh, one whose religion was vegetarian, and uh -huh, yeah. so I saw a lot of her relatives and so on. <laughs> one of the reasons is they cheat, um, <laughs> but you know when they don't eat um, the protein, they make up for it by eating sugar, and they do end up with cavities. Yeah. But anybody can have cavities. Anybody cannot have cavities. The protein uh, stimulates a fluid flow through the tooth that prevents dental decay. When you're too low on protein, the fluid is going to come in. You're going to be susceptible to dental decay as well as whatever your genetic weak link is in the rest of disease. Uh huh. So say say Patrick had a low protein level, and you're going to eat some more meat. If you do like a, we like this whey protein or protein from spirulina, does that raise the protein level in the blood, or does it just take the aminals? No, it doesn't. Uh, no, I, no, it doesn't. What? I didn't understand the answer. All right. Protein at one time in its life cycle walked. Yeah. Whey does not walk. Whey does not whey walk. Very well in the animal. We used to make animal supplements. And whey does very well. Cattle really metabolize whey. Humans don't, but it's advertised heavily. Spirulina is a very negative, along with a couple of other things that have been used, advertised the same, chlorella. Because of uh, the mercury? Yeah. Anything that's raised in water uh, is going to have mercury yeah. in it. So, so you're saying uh, nothing but, in your experience, animal protein is necessary to get the number up where you have yeah. good health for teeth. Yeah. The okay. B I just want to be clear on that. We didn't mention, but it is extremely important, blood urea nitrogen. BUN is an indication from the nutritional standpoint of how many amino acids that you have. Now, 
available for reconstruction because just because you eat the meat does not mean you're breaking it down and making it available as tubifores to rebuild the body. Gotcha. Protein metabolism is complicated. Eating it is one thing, but if you take beef and make it uh, well done, you might as well eat shoe leather. Yeah, it's yeah, not been any no, good. For nothing you. happened. And your favorite BU N number is 15? Yeah, that's mm-hmm. right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay, um, can, you, can you hang around a little bit and do some emails? Yeah. You sure? Okay, all right. We're not keeping you from like, doing real work, are we? Mm, no, I have a series of things to do that have to do with pens and uh, paper. <laughs> I see. All right, stay right there. Dr. Hal Huggins, now we're going to get to some emails. We've got somebody who's been on hold forever. Sorry about that, but I, I, never, I never did still get the answer to the sugar Carb question. Doctor Huggins is on hold, and I want to I want to understand how that uh, infects the arteries. Sugar, carbs, and this, and then and then we're going to do the emails, and we're going to do a quick break, and then we're going to do it all. So stay right there with Doctor Hal Huggins. Previously with Master Herbalist Stephen Buner on pine pollen. It would became a regular part of the diet because it's such a good nutrient food, and pine pollen more of a a nutrient herb that helps the whole body be more vital and strong. I became interested in it, looking at how you could use it to raise male testosterone levels for guys in middle age. So I began looking at that in some depth and found that there's a lot of number of plants on earth that contain testosterone in them that's pharmaceutically identical to the testosterone in our bodies. And that sort of started the whole thing off. And pine pollen is one of those. Pine pollen is probably the highest in testosterone of any plant that I've found so far. I mean, it's exactly molecularly identical to that in our body. Pine pollen from Sir Thrival. It's strong. It works. Click and order all Sir Thrival links. Front page, oneradionetwork.com. We're with Al Carter. He's one of the top authorities on rebound exercise. Now, you talk about G-force and really leveraging being one of the most effective forms of exercise. Can you explain why that is? Yes. Uh, with rebound exercise, we're using two other forces that are natural, the force of acceleration and the force of deceleration in a vertical mode. They come together with the gravity at the bottom of the bounce, which means that you're developing a greater G-force effect at the bottom of the bounce, and the cells of the body have to become stronger, and they really don't have a choice. So then you're using this idea of going up in the air and coming back down as actually increasing the force on your body. It increases the force on the body, on every cell in the body, regardless of where it is, which means that you're not only exercising the muscles, you're exercising the bones, the involuntary muscles, the muscles of digestion and elimination, and even the cells of the eyes. The Rebound Air Rebounder. We think the best with a lifetime warranty. Click and order, front page, or in our store, oneradionetwork.com. Okay, it's two ninety nine, two hundred ninety nine Federal Reserve Notes. And that's continental, I can say it, continental United States only for two ninety nine. Now, if you live in Alaska, you live in Hawaii, you live in Canada, or you live in mm, Colorado Springs, it's just kidding about Colorado Springs, it, outside the country, it's extra, generally only about 50 bucks. So email me, patrick at oneradionetwork.com, and to get this lifetime warranty rebounder, uh, for two ninety nine, that will tell you what the extra shipping is. If you want to do that, then you can pay that, and then we're rock and roll, and you'll get it in about three days or so, or four days. Well, longer if you're outside the country, but inside the country, three four days through uh, UPS ground. It's a cool thing, the Rebounder Lifetime Warranty. Nothing is more expensive than bad information. Know the source. OneRadioNetwork.com Talk to Patrick now. 888-663-6386 Or email Patrick at OneRadioNetwork.com Okay, it's an honor to have Dr. Hal Huggins. Anybody who does anything for 50 years, they got to know something. I mean, isn't that right, Dr. Huggins? you got to have picked up something along the way. Mm. I was just writing that down. It was an interesting <laughs> quote. <laughs> That's right. You got to learn something in fifty years. Okay. Now, before the emails, you kind of didn't do answer my sugar, um, complex carb, mm, bread, cookie, cake, crackers, 
Sure. Yeah, okay, the, question. The what, what's the diet is all about, because some people can handle a lot and some people can't. Ah. But uh, this goes back to dentistry again. A lot of the major discoveries in uh, nutrition were made by dentists. Melvin Page, back uh, <clears throat> probably close to 100 years ago now, hmm. uh, found that when the serum blood serum phosphorus level drops below 3.5 milligrams, uh, people have a lot of decay. Huh. If it's above that, they don't have dental decay. If it's at 4.0, uh, you know, they can be 50, 60, 70 years old and still not have any decay. Phosphorus. Hmm. Yeah, the serum phosphorus. Well, the serum phosphorus is not the amount of phosphorus you're eating. It is the balance of the endocrine glands, <clears throat> because the endocrine glands are paired up against each other, like estrogen and testosterone. Uh, you got to have both. All males, all females have both. Uh, but it's got to be in a certain balance. If that's out of balance, then the serum phosphorus goes below 3.5. Well, if we take that over across from Florida into California to Loma Linda, you find Ralph Steinman doing research at Loma Linda University, and he found that there's this fluid flow that we had mentioned earlier that goes from the pulp chamber through the uh, dentin, through the enamel into the mouth, carrying nutrients with it, keeping the tooth alive and healthy, and preventing decay from coming in, preventing the debris and bacteria from the mouth of coming in the tooth. But if you get um, below that, then it turns into a suction machine and sucks the debris from the mouth into the tooth and acids and uh, bacteria and all this kind of stuff resulting in dental decay. Well, what Page found by accident was, uh, I think the first thing he noticed is people with severe arthritis, when he balanced the chemistry and got the phosphorus above 3.5, their arthritis went away. Hmm. Hmm. Wasn't that interesting? And then he found that leukemia would improve, that cancer would improve. Da-da, 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 hmm. da-da. So it is an indicator, the blood chemistry is an indicator of the health of the whole body. Ah. And so if you're eating carbohydrate, it pushes the... Um, serum phosphorus down. Protein brings it up. So how much do you need? Look at your serum phosphorus level along with the uh, <clears throat> the total protein that we were talking mm -hmm. about. Mm -hmm. uh, would it be okay to hold for five seconds? Oh, we can do more than five seconds. Just go I just need somebody to bring me a sip of water. So no, no, no problem. You stay on, right there. I'm just going to do a little plug for uh, our show is coming up. Andrew Goss is going to be here tomorrow. And if you have a question for Andrew, email please patrick at oneradionetwork.com and we'll get it on the air. He's a top guy with the world in the world of, of finance. And then on Thursday, if I can get to the show schedule, schedule, yeah, on Thursday, we got uh, Alan Cassell's and he's got a lot of interesting stuff to say about all the different screening and testing going on that I think you're going to find fascinating. And Dr. John Nissim, and I S I M, he's in uh, integrative therapies for cancer and all diseases. So that's on Thursday. Then open phone Friday. We're going to have Rami Ram, Rami Nagel on the fellow that writes about diet and oh, go figure, tooth health on next Monday. So that'll be fun. And then Dr. Massey next Thursday. We're with Dr. Hal Huggins. Okay. He's, Huggins is back. Huggins is back. So speak up. Get right in that phone. So, okay. Now, I, I still got to try because I still don't understand one thing. So mm. bear with me. So sure. when the people that can't handle a lot of carbs, and I guess it's a certain percentage. Some people can... Just eat pasta every day and do okay, I guess? I don't know. The Italians in particular. Okay. But the people yeah. that don't, that don't do well with the carbs, can you, do you know how the sugar and the excess carbs causes this inflammation in the arteries? Do we know? Well, too, there are several reasons behind this. Uh, one of them in particular is that um, the white blood cells, 
um, what do they do? They eat bacteria. Uh huh. All right. Uh, they kind of keep us away from disease by killing off bacteria and other things. All right. They have something called a phagocytic index. A phagocyte is one of these white cells that eats stuff that shouldn't be there. Mm-hmm. Right, the phagocytic index means how many bacteria can a white blood cell eat at one time. Hmm. And a perfect, um, a perfect reading is 16. That means that the that one bacterium can uh, consume sixteen one white blood cell mm-hmm. and consume sixteen bacteria and process them at one time. Huh. You eat one candy bar, which has chocolate, which has sugar, usually sixty two percent sugar, mm-hmm. etc. The phagocytic index drops to one. Wow! So the same as having white blood cells at 5,000 suddenly going down to 500 or something of that nature. So any minor challenge, any minor thing that would scar up like the bacteria from the root canals, hey, it doesn't scar up the vessels Uh, all over the place uh. and calcium deposition and so on because the white blood cells cannot act efficiently. Ah, gotcha. So that's... Yeah, so it's all the immune system thing. So there are, though, some cultures, I guess, people, uh, Northern Europeans and such, they they can eat more of the pasta or the bread, Dr. Huggins, that does turn to sugar, I guess, but they can get away with it just because of their ancestry. Their ancestry, you're right. That's where the ancestral diet comes from. I got you. Yeah, hmm. if they have been in an area where there's uh, a high... Phagocytic or high incidence of the, well, the sugars that we had 150 years ago are not the refined sugars we have today. Sure. It's like sugar cane. <clears throat> I heard the other day how much, something like one foot of sugar cane is one spoonful of sugar. And uh, these kids would eat sugar cane. Well, it takes you all day to eat a foot of sugar cane. Well, all. One teaspoon of sugar a day is not going to do a whole lot of damage. <clears throat> but if you have one uh, soft drink, you've got eight or ten um, teaspoons of sugar right there. And uh, the average person, whoever that is in the United States, consumes six cans, six bottles of soft drink a day. Yeah. So would it be a correct assumption that no matter what your ancestral diet, Terry, system is, if you're doing Coke, Pepsi, whatever, those kind of things, it's going to be very difficult for the body to deal with that kind of, that amount of sugar. Well, we've got something we may want to talk about in the future that we have just come up with, Mm. that DNA department can test. Yeah. And that is an enzyme that tells the hypothalamus when you're full. You know, you eat And, uh, oh, man, I couldn't eat another bite. That means you're full. All right, if this gets turned off uh, and certain of the dental materials turn that off, then you continue to eat and gives you overweight, which has nothing to do with sugar. Wow. Now, as one of the technicians said, uh, (laughs) Coca-Cola and Pepsi-Cola and all these guys are really going to enjoy that information. Yeah, they will. A, a picture I might send to you if we've got somebody around here who can, hmm. what do you do, scan it or something? Yeah, something like, like that. Like, like, you got two rats side by side that are siblings from the same litter. And if they were humans, one of them would look like 300 pounds and the other one looks like 100 pounds. There is that much difference between them. I mean, one is just terribly obese. And yet they were on the same diet. All right, why did one do it and the other not? Because that enzyme, uh, or not an enzyme, that gene became damaged. And so if you have a damaged gene, <clears throat> then we need to work on gene repair more than the diet. You know, diet will help, but you're still hungry all the time. Yeah, yeah. 
Uh, Dr. Hal Huggins is with us 20 minutes after the hour. Okay, we have lots of emails, and we'll, we'll just, uh, you know, kind of uh, see how long Dr. Huggins can put up with us and take these emails, take these phone calls. You ready, Doc? I'm ready. Okay, here we go. So if you can keep these, now this is a, a laugh, but if you can keep these answers short and concise... We we can uh, we can just. Do, do you know who you're talking to? I from? know, I know. I just like I said, this is just laughable. But I got to say it. It's okay. Just do whatever you want, brother. You know, you do fine. Well, it's just fine. Uh, we go for quality, not quantity, around here, right? Okay. 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 So let's take this call. So thanks so much for holding. I know you've been holding a long time. What's your first name? Where are you calling from? Are you talking to me? Yes, ma'am. Oh, um, my name's Michelle. I'm calling from Vermont. Okay. Patrick- Try to contact you for other things to get a rebounder, but I have trouble getting through. Um, I'm going to talk fast so that... Well, just take your time. You have a question for Dr. Huggins. I do. Okay. And uh, first of all, I want to thank Dr. Huggins. I've I've listened to lots of his stuff, and I really appreciate all his work. It's great. Okay. Um, My question is this. I'm getting ready to do biological dentistry. There's one biological dentist in my area. I saw him... Oh, I don't know, maybe a year and a half ago. I didn't have the money to do it at that time. I have stage 4 cancer, um, breast bone. Hmm. Um, I'm, in, by everybody's account, in fabulous condition. I mean, apparently I look really healthy. I've been working on this with diet, getting my cholesterol up, all that kind of stuff, um, do all kinds of things like qigong and whatever. Now, my question is this. Before I do the the dentistry, because I'm really scared about doing this. I've got cavitations. I'm a, uh, you know, a dental. My mouth is a disaster. A lot of stuff. And um, what are the right questions for me to ask this dentist before we start? I know about rubber dams and suction, but what questions should I ask to make sure I'm getting treated properly? And what things do I need to find out in terms of the aftercare? You know, just in case, am I making sense yeah. when I this, after care? This is one of the reasons I'm writing these books, because the book Patient Empowerment, which is in, available through our office, we didn't give you the telephone number, but we do have a telephone number. I've got your telephone number. I'm going to order it. I heard you talking about it earlier. Yeah. Well, that'd be an important thing to get that book and, yeah. and read that before you go. It's got all this, uh, it's got the answers to to the questions that you should be asking. That's why it gives you patient empowerment, because it tells you what questions to ask the dentist and what answers fit your lifestyle best. Uh, The cell phone number here is 866-948-4638. 866-948-4638. Yeah, and and the amount of money you're going to probably pay and all... Dr. Huggins, she has to be real careful before she goes, right? Well, I need to mention one thing. There is this loose term called biological dentist. Right. Uh, you had mentioned that uh, I had started this thing, the Alliance of Dentists. Mm-hmm. We had about 100 dentists in there who followed my protocol. And then I found out that they're calling themselves biological dentists, but over half of them were doing root canals, and hmm. even more than that, we're doing implant. That's not biological dentist. But if you look at most of the biological dentist and you tell them what's the cholesterol level, oh, zero, I think would probably be best. You know, they have no idea how to interpret blood chemistries. So ask them, can you interpret a blood chemistry? Can you interpret a CBC? CBC stands for complete blood count, and that's the one that tells you immediately what your immune system is doing because dentistry controls your immune system. And if you've got, uh, con- if they've got control over the immune system, they need to know how to drive it. So watch out for the name biological dentist. They are now getting together, learning to be biological dentists, but there are a lot of people who figure that just means I'll yank your fillings, your mercury fillings out for a price and put in something white. Sure, sure. So 60% of me, white fillings way. have uh, aluminum in them, which is almost as dangerous as mercury. For example, Michelle, do you know that Dr. Huggins has learned that if you get your cavitations done or root canal or something, 
and they plop you in your car and you drive home, that those things can go bad just because of that driving after yeah. after the after the surgery? Did you know that? Three miles. Okay. I, hey, you got it. You got it. So that you know, got it. I, I can, heard your talk well, limit. Wolf. You know the last conference. Um, brilliant. I listened to it maybe six times, both hours. <laughs> I, it was a wonderful. You were wonderful in that. Um, and I picked up all the info I could from that, and I heard to shake them by the feet, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, it sounds like you're on it. I hope that uh, you'll just take your time before you go do this. Okay, Michelle? Yep. Th- thanks and for calling. I, I yeah, just most of those thank answers thank are you. in the patient empowerment, and if they're not, they'll be in the next books when I get around to writing it, which is when somebody says, I'd like to see it. Okay, my dear. Thanks for calling. Yeah, it's just real important. I mean, this is a... These these uh, these surgeries and these revisions are, they they can get costly, right, Doc? And it's very important, so you don't have to go and do them again. That's exactly right. Yeah. Because you get <laughs> ten miles in an automobile. I don't care if it's a Rolls Royce. You're going to shatter that poor little blood clot in there and form a new cavitation. Uh, okay. Good here's, retirement program for the dentist. <laughs> here's an email from C. She is in New York, New York. Can you ask Dr. Huggins if real salt is okay to use as I cannot get pickling salt in the city? Now, she's not looked very hard if she can't find pickling salt in New York City, but go ahead no, and answer the question. No, she's question. right, because you can, uh, come the women on. in New York and Chicago and Los Angeles don't do canning anymore. If you look at Bug Tussle, Texas, uh, if you look at uh, Dripping Springs, Texas, we got you, it. you got it there. Uh, you can go online, and I presume that means Amazon.com or going directly to Morton's. Mm-hmm. Um, you can't get it in Europe, so we send it to people in Europe, and it's something like three dollars for the salt and a hundred dollars <laughs> for the postage. That's hilarious. So she asked about real salt. No, <clears throat> no, real salt still has the uh, aluminum additives in it. Aluminum additives. So yeah. you you advocate Morton's pickling and canning. You've seen that when people do this, their sodium and their levels get right. Sodium and potassium levels come where they belong, as well as the chloride, as well as assisting in protein metabolism. Hmm. Well, that gets to be a little complicated, but it's all in there. Yeah. Can I give you a little uh, anecdotal thing here? So Patrick has been using sea salt for a long time because now wait a minute because you know what I know you know what happens every time you're on the show I say oh I'm going to do this pickle and canning so I use that and about two months later I start saying oh man I need those minerals I can't you know I, I love Dr. Huggins but I don't know if he's right I think I'm going to go back and do sea you know that's what I did right okay so so here is my latest blood test two weeks ago this has been on a sea salt and I mean lots of sea salt right because I, I love it. You know what my sodium level is? What? 131. That is really low. Really low. I mean, that's not even low. That's not, like really low. Yeah. Because yeah, your number is 141, right? 142. 142. So my potassium, let's see, or my chloride, that's low as well. That's 98. And it should be 107. 107. Which other? What's the other one on my sea salt? What is it? Mm, what other one do I look at for sea salt? Uh, yeah. Chloride. Chloride? I told chloride, you. Chloride, uh, you did. The sodium, potassium, and chloride are the three electrolytes that work hand in glove at the synapse and, and getting things in and out of the cell membrane. My potassium is low too, 4.2. Your magic target is 4.5. Correct. So, so why is it, explain to me why... After all these months of doing sea salt and all this great food that I'm thinking, my best diet ever with good protein, that these numbers are wacko. <clears throat> okay. Why? What happened there? What yeah. went wrong? What went wrong? What happens is that the sea salt, you know, they say, well, this is 10 million years old. Sure, sure. Okay, keep that in mind, because what does a mineral do? It transports an electron. Sea salt lost its electrons 10 million years ago. So it is there, but it's not carrying its electron. Okay. 
So it's like having a checkbook with no checks in it. You can't write one there. You just got the checkbook. Okay. So you need the electrons. The salt that has the electron is what keeps you fit and uh, alive and healthy and all that. But if you take one... Now, uh, some of the sea salts will give a very, very high level, uh, 146, 147, and so on. And that's indicative of a tremendous deficiency because the blood is trying to correct the cellular deficiency. Oh. Yeah, we talked about this earlier. Mm -hmm. That sea salt Mm -hmm. is good for creating that problem. Hmm. It's good to put on your sidewalk if you're going to slip. But, Doc, let let me ask you this. Now, the sea salt I was using to get these rotten numbers, I won't mention the brand because I'll get sued, no, is two okay, different... I'll two, bet it was Himalayan. <laughs> no, no, it wasn't even that. It was two, two different kinds of salt, one from Hawaii, one from Europe, one from... It's a pink kind of salt. It's solar dried, right? Solar, not old stuff. This is from the ocean. Why wouldn't that work to get my numbers where they need to be? Yeah, theoretically it should. If it's taken from the ocean, then it hasn't been there for millions of right, years. Right. And if it was sun dried, right. theoretically it would have its electrons. Okay. If it didn't, there was something else done in the process that they didn't tell you about. But let me ask you this then. Maybe it's not the salt's problem with these numbers. There's something else going on with my little Italian body that's causing this, which is possible. Well, if you take the seawater and you bleach that out, uh, evaporate it, mm-hmm. you've got about 40 or 50 other metals in there, too. Oh, uh, oh. Lead, mercury, and cadmium are some of them. And that screws up a lot of stuff. You got it. Yeah. So it could be that you're just picking up too many contaminants because, after all, uh, your sea salt and stuff from that it comes from the bottom of the world's biggest cesspool. Yeah. Well, I've told the listeners, and I said this on the air when I got this last blood test a couple of weeks ago, that I'm going to get on this, and I'm not going back this time, Doc. You've got me this time. So I'm on the pickling and canning, and we'll take the blood test again in three months or so, and we'll see. Yeah, take it in a month and see if you haven't changed. Just get the uh, really? just get the electrolytes done. Just oh, just get, get the electrolytes? Yeah, that'd be cheap. Okay. All yeah, right. it'll change in a matter of a uh, few weeks. It depends on how contaminated you are. If it hasn't changed, then let me know because I want a life insurance policy on you. Oh, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. That's all right. Okay. Could you please ask Dr. Huggins the following two questions from Jonathan, uh, who's a chiropractor in Australia. Can ozone injection into a cavitation or root canal create temp... (laughs) I I know you... uh, Okay. Create temporary... No, he's only asking about create temporary relief thereby confirming that it needs intervention by a dentist trained by you. Huh. So he's saying, well, I don't understand the question exactly. Can an ozone injection into a cavitation or root canal create temporary relief? Oh, that it only creates temporary relief, thereby yeah. confirming that you need to get it out. I guess that's what he's asking. Uh, I would say it was stretching the point because... I don't know, this is a little crude, but if you hit somebody over the head with a hammer, you know, all their pain would go away until they woke up. <laughs> it's, it's kind of the same thing. You know, it's thinking in the right direction. However, any cavitation is contaminated with bacteria. Now, an easier way to get this done is to have a dentist make a little tiny hole mm-hmm. with drill into the cavitation area and take a syringe with sterile water in it and uh, squirt it in and out, just a... Mm -hmm. I guess it would be sterile saline. Yeah. And, uh, you know, send us five or six drops or send us the syringe, and we'll tell you the bacteria that were in there. But the ozone, um, we did this test just, oh, less than six months ago. Um where we had a cadaver bone uh, well, the bone graft material where we took it as it was and then treated it with ozone to see what would happen. Well, the sterile bone for bone grafts ended up having uh, 54 different pathological bacteria in it, so I wouldn't consider that real sterile. 
But in treating it with uh, ozone, it was another one of these, good grief! Uh, We had no idea of what we were going to find for an answer because there are two types of bacteria. There are aerobic and there are anaerobic. The aerobic live on oxygen, and some of those are kind of dangerous, like botulism and tetanus. And then there are anaerobic, which the majority of your disease-producing bacteria are anaerobic. Um, Okay, we treated with ozone, and man, did it kill off the anaerobes. Oh, man, they just did. But oxygen, the extra oxygen in the ozone, stimulated the aerobic bacteria to come up and create worse diseases than what they had to start with. Wow. So that was a real surprise to us, and, you know, it's real irritating to people who clean things out and use ozone and think, oh, man, I'm really sterilizing things. Well, you're killing off the the one guy in the black hat and you're fortifying the other guy in the black hat. Would breathing out, breathing oxygen do the same thing? Yeah. But then there's oxygen in the air, though. Aren't we doing it when we take a breath? I'm sorry, say that again? In other words, when there's oxygen in the air we breathe. Doesn't that do the same thing? Well, yeah. Mm. And do we have bacteria in our body? Yep. Yeah, we do. That's why we need white blood cells. But we have adjusted to... Uh, a balance here, that those people who couldn't balance things out died in childhood, did not continue their lineage, and those, well, it's like there's a certain pattern you see in red blood cells that comes out of England from the time they had the plague, what was it, in 1400 or so? Mm -hmm. Uh, Their genetics uh, was a little bit different from everybody else if they survived. And those people we can pick out in the United States. I happen to be one of them. And uh, so when I see a test come through that has the same pattern that I, then, hey, cousin, how are you? Hmm. I know that they are, are you from, you know, genetically going back before 1600? My relatives came here in 1600. Uh, Were your relatives back in England? Well, yeah, they were. So it's, uh, that's kind of interesting there. Yeah, yeah. It's how much oxygen you can handle. You have a little bit higher level of oxygen than the vast majority of people. Here's the second part of this chiropractor's question from Australia. Are there any other tests that can be performed to confirm that the presence of a cavitation or root canal is causing someone's current symptoms? I read on Dr. McCullough's website that Boyd Haley and Kurt Pendergrass designed a kit for proving that a root canal was harboring toxic microbes. Have you, yeah. heard, have you heard about this? Well, yeah. Uh, I'm probably the reason why they invented that. Oh. <laughs> I worked with Boyd Haley in starting this in the first place. What they have done is take five of the critical enzymes in the body and expose it to fluids from a root canal. Well, uh, if the enzymes are killed, that shows that the root canal had bacteria. Uh, What we're doing is showing you who those bacteria are because any of them will kill the enzymes. They had to dilute it three times before they showed uh, that it didn't kill everything. But, you know, we found more bacteria in um, cavitations than in root canals. We're up to about 53 in root canals and about 82 in cavitations. But any of those 82 will kill the um, the enzymes that are important, and that proves, yeah, the root canal tooth or the cavitation, either one, is bad, but it doesn't tell you what it's going to do. What DNA tells us is are the bacteria there targeted to heart disease or to neurological or to liver or kidney or brain or what? So we can show you what the target is, where that just showed that this, there is the presence of bacteria. It does kill the enzymes. Any of them, any of those bacteria will kill the enzymes. Okay. Here's a question from Zay, and from Jay in South Carolina. If the surgeon that does the cavitation surgery uses ozone, why should they clean up the site first before treating it with ozone? 
because you have to remove the corpses. You know, see these is bacteria in there. Okay, you kill them off, you got to get rid of them. And uh, they are in the bone, they are in the periodontal ligament, so you've got to take a burr and cut things out. Now, if you want to uh, go in and cut things out and then use a little ozone afterwards, okay, I don't have any objections to that. But if you use just ozone, you're going to kill but leave the dead bodies behind. And the thing is, uh, the dead bodies still have their DNA in them, and as that decomposes... Hmm. DNA does not decompose. So a friendly bacteria can come along and pick it up and become a pathological bacteria. Got it. Uh, Second question here. With the scarcity of PZI, what is that? Both in the United States and Mexico, has they been able to find a ready available substitute? Do you know what PZI is? Oh, yeah. Oh, what is The one who started the PZI thing. What is PZI? Protamine zinc insulin. Oh, this person knows a whole lot more than I. We do. I oh my God. I just got a brand new bottle yesterday, as a matter of fact. Pro- what is it? Yeah, the thing is, it stops a whole lot of diseases. For instance, uh, what does it cost in your area? Texas is a lot less than most places. What does it cost in your area to get a shingles vaccination? I don't know. Yeah, it's about 220 bucks here. In some places, it's higher than that. Mm-hmm. Oh, uh, we can take care of shingles for 39 cents. With PZI? Yeah. What is PZI? Say that word again. Insulin. Ins- it's a time-release form of insulin. Huh. And it drops blood. Well, I wrote a book called The 55 Non-Diabetic Uses for Insulin. It's called PZI is the name of the book. But this little book goes through the 55 different things that it improves. I mean, you take... Like I saw something on uh, the Today Show the other day, a guy who had been found up at the top of Everest, and he had gone, they thought he was dead. Well, he woke up, took his gla- his gloves off, and got frostbite. Well, all you have to do, they bandaged him and did all kinds of things, said they may, in fact, I think he was from Australia, uh, they were going to have to cut his hands off. If you'd put an injection in the wrist on either side, that frostbite would go away. We have taken toes that were black from gangrene, and two to three injections, you've got everything back again. I mean, it is magic, but it's an economical disaster because, you know, they're making lots of money off of this shingles vaccine, and if it only costs, you know, the doctor's offices cost something, the syringe does and all that, so... Mm -hmm. In all honesty, they really should charge $10 or more for an injection. But that's still better than uh, 190 And, you know, you take, or 200 uh, you take the vaccine and it's only 40% effective. Well, that's by guesswork. You don't know whether you were going to get it or not. And it's only good for two years. Well, so every two years you got to shell out another 200 bucks for the vaccine where if you didn't catch it, it wouldn't cost you anything. If you did, uh, a few bucks would uh, reverse it in, ready for this, 24 hours. Oh. Hmm. Yeah. So PZ, uh, now our listeners are going to run and go out on the Internet and try to buy some PZI. They probably know. Well, there is one state that makes it now. Mm -hmm. This is recent. And you have to buy it within the state. It's illegal to ship it out of the state because it might help somebody. That's the state of Washington. Washington now has a place up there that manufactures it. Hmm. Well, we just know somebody in Washington. They'll send it to us. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay. It's illegal. You know, you might get put in jail. Might get put in the electric chair because it might help somebody. Mm-hmm. Do I get sarcastic? You do as you sometimes. Uh, uh, you ever notice that? Here's an email. In one of your past interviews with Hal, he said that alternating aggressive oral rinses with salt water and vitamin C 30 minutes apart for 24 hours straight would cure any periodontal infection. I think that's what he said. With that as a starting point, well, this... Well, that's a little more complicated than what is actually needed. Yeah. You, 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 you said, though, not vitamin C, but it was... Let's see, potassium ascorbate, right? No, no. Uh, um, sodium ascorbate. Sodium ascorbate, excuse me. Yeah. Yeah, but uh, you can just do it once or twice a day. It's a mixture of sodium ascorbate and uh, 
sodium chloride table salt and uh, taking transmix with it uh, to condition the cell membrane. And if you do it once a day, uh, you'll see a big difference in a week. If you do it twice a day, you'll see a big difference in three or four days. But it's, the trick is the word aggressive. Uh, you take a half a spoonful of that in about two ounces or one ounce of water. You want a real concentrated solution. And aggressively, for about three seconds. And, man, those tissues sit up and take note right away. And the transmix conditions the cell membrane to allow the sodium and so on to go in to allow healing to take place. And we have also seen or had reports that uh, the bone starts growing back at about one millimeter a year. Well, you know, two or three years, that's two or three millimeters. That means you're keeping your teeth and keeping your gums. And it is amazing um, the number of people who have saved thousands of dollars. I think what we've got here, the package and everything is, I don't know, maybe 50 bucks, something like that. And um, the least we've seen it uh, change who, from people who are already scheduled with the periodontist for surgery, uh, the least they've saved is $4,000. Wow. So That's it's yeah, so what uh, so like a teaspoon of sodium ascorbate and a teaspoon of table salt. No, it's a quarter of a quarter to a half a teaspoon of the mixture that we put together. Oh, I see. You got a little mixture because you put the transmix in, which is a sub a nutrient that you created, right? Yes, and that's a separate pill. Yeah, that's a separate pill. Yeah, now, when you create these different nutrients, I know you have some at your clinic there. Um, wh- what's the source of those? And why do they work? I mean, well, how would you figure out that they work? Uh, the reason it works is this is the only system that was ever put together that I've heard of uh, using human beings as the guinea pig, so to speak. In other words, uh, you find somebody with a deficiency and you give them 5 milligrams, 10 milligrams, 15 milligrams, hey, 17 milligrams, it works. So it took several years to put this together that those supplements we can predict what's going to happen to the blood chemistry because we've seen it thousands and thousands of times. Uh, you can't prove that. You can't. We can't really write it, put it in writing because you have to pay fifteen million dollars per supplement to have them run this through a university. Well, you know, I just use people. I don't use universities. I don't waste fifteen million dollars per. But if we watch the blood chemistry. We can see what it does. And if we know what a chemistry is, we know what the uh, what the best chances of recovery are going to be according to what the chemistry is. Okay, here's an email from David. To remove or not to remove is the question. I have an uh, over-erupted upper wisdom tooth. My lower one was removed about 20 years ago, and my dentist keeps suggesting that I should get it removed before it starts to crumble. The tooth is in good health and not causing any problems or discomfort. What would you recommend to any of your patients who had this condition? Mm, uh, go read the funny papers instead. If it's not, now, if you, you have to put these conditions in, that if it's not giving any trouble, if there's no infection around it and so on, because you have the tooth removed, and 99.99% of the time, the dentist is not going to do the cavitation procedure because there aren't but a couple hundred dentists in the United States who do it. So you're going to end up with a cavitation up there. Well, you're better off with a tooth that's over-erupting. I mean, hey, that's what I was taught in school. I used to do a lot of that. There's a special instrument. You can pop one of those out in less than five seconds. No, oh, that was fun. <clears throat> but if it's not giving any problem, if there's no infection, if the crown is not covered up by bone and tissue, leave it alone. Leave it alone. From Robert, can you please explain the problems with titanium implants? I know you're always saying anything implanted in the bone will cause an immune problem, but what actually does the titanium metal cause? Well, the titanium metal does not have your license plate on it. Therefore, it creates an autoimmune disease because the body is trying to get rid of it. There's something in there that doesn't belong there, and the body's going to get rid of it. Titanium or anything, or what's that, what's that new fancy one that came over from Europe a few years ago that everybody was excited about? Um, uh, 
You know which one I mean. There's well, one of those. There are a bunch of them I've heard of, and it doesn't matter because the correct word there was anything. Anything. From Greta, what are the issues with gold crowns? I have three gold inlays. Are they a problem? If you had them in your mouth, would you have them removed? All right, the gold is not going to be a problem, but gold is a little soft, so they always put other metals in with it. Uh, but uh, we did find when we had our center here in Colorado Springs, uh, we took off lots of gold crowns because we found mercury underneath. And this was more than a 1,000. We found uh, an amalgam buildup, a mercury buildup, underneath 98% of them. Wow. If it is a gold crown, now, you know, you can have 5% gold, and it's called Midas gold, and uh, they sell it as being a gold crown. If the gold concentration is up about 85% or so, then you're in good shape, unless it has palladium in it. If it has platinum as a hardener, uh, this is fine. If it has palladium, this is not fine. 35% of the people are going to have a serious reaction to palladium. But don't go taking it out just for the fun of it. Uh, is there a disease process? Is there an imbalance in the chemistry? Is there some reason to start looking for a cause? If it is a uh, plain vanilla gold crown that uh, doesn't have anything bad in it and doesn't have mercury underneath it, it's okay, but if you have the uh, buildup underneath, the thing is, if you put a bunch of amalgam underneath the, the preparation for a gold crown, I tell you, amalgam costs a whole lot less than gold, and so it was just a space filler, so you didn't have to buy as much gold. But the galvanic action between the amalgam and the uh, gold pushes the mercury right up the bone, if it's the upper, right into the brain or into the lower jaw. And this is the problem, is the galvanic reaction, the electrical reaction between the uh, silver filling, silver colored filling, and the gold. Okay. From John, now that I have all my four root canals removed, I have teeth number 8, 12, 13, 14 missing on top. What would be a good to put in place of these? Are bridges okay in your studies? What would you put if it were in, you're in, in your mouth, a bridge, a partial, or what else? Yeah, okay. Some I, say bridges uh, tie up the energy meridians. Yeah, I had an argument with an ice cube not too long ago. I ended up losing a tooth over the deal. And what do I have? I have a removable partial for that because I didn't particularly want the teeth cut down. But you've got a choice. Uh, if you've got several teeth removed, it's a whole lot cheaper to have a partial made, because a partial for one tooth or three teeth or five teeth costs the same. But you get five bridges put in, and you're talking ten, fifteen thousand dollars um, $15,000. It's a matter of what can you get along with. Now... I wear glasses. I have four pair of glasses, you know, for close-up and this and this and that and the other thing. What am I wearing right now? Nothing. The uh, glasses are sitting by my right elbow and by my left elbow, but I'm not wearing them. Why? I don't like to wear glasses. Why? I, I don't know. It just irritates me to wear glasses. So it would probably irritate me to wear a partial. Well, it kind of does because I just use it when I eat. Mm hmm but if you don't want the fuss and bother with it, and you have a bridge put in, it is 95% like your ordinary teeth. I mean, it takes you about an extra 10 seconds in brushing your teeth to pay attention to it, run some floss underneath it. Uh, but you don't have to do anything else with it. Uh, partial, you've got to take care of. The bridge is part of you. The bridge costs more than the partial. It's a matter of what can you get along with. Yeah. You want to make sure, too, I guess, Doc, that you... Now, let me say, be sure to get something put in, because if you don't, those teeth are going to shift. Yeah. And the space between them gets a little bigger. You get food trapped in there. You get gum disease, dental decay. Hey, it's downhill for the next 10 years after that. So whatever you do, get it replaced. But if you're replacing it with a partial... 
the important thing is that it is clear acrylic, clear plastic. You can see through it. It looks almost like glass. If it's pink, guess what they use as a pigment to make it pink? Hmm, I have no idea. Mercury. Mer oh, my goodness. From Holly, New York, New York. I was wondering if Dr. Huggins could comment on wisdom teeth removal. I have impacted wisdom teeth, and while no major issues, they do seem to be causing me pain from time to time. I prefer to... Prefer to... Uh, I don't know. I, I can't understand that. Okay. Yeah, I get the idea. Yeah. Uh, the complete answer is in the book uh, Patient Empowerment. But the brief answer is a tooth, including a wisdom tooth, is made from two different sources in the body. The body has three things called germ layers in it. And the root and the bone are from the same source. The crown is made from ectoderm, which is a different source. So when a tooth is forming, it forms this crown, and the body doesn't like ectoderm within the mesoderm, <laughs> so it tries to get rid of it, which we call a tooth erupting. And when it comes up into the mouth and is away from the bone, it stops, and that's why the teeth stay there to a certain extent. There's, it's a little more complicated sure. than that. But the bad part is if you have an impacted tooth, the body decides it's going to get rid of what does not belong in bone, even if it is you, it's the wrong germ material, and it creates an autoimmune disease based on an impacted wisdom tooth. I have seen this with multiple sclerosis where you know, people would have no fillings, no nothing in their mouth, no root canals, and nothing like that. Mm. But they came down with multiple sclerosis. And um, so you find an impacted wisdom tooth can create that. And if you're ready for this, if a tooth does not form, you look at x-ray and there's nothing there, the seeds are still there. There is a cavitation, but you can't see it. I've seen that cause multiple sclerosis, too. Wayne in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada writes, Do mercury fillings cause eye floaters or cloudy eyes? My vision is okay or just those symptoms. I'm 48, excellent health, take no medication. Would removing the mercury fillings help? Uh, if we put it that way, would it help? Yes, it might help 10 or 20 percent. But if you balance the chemistry, then you can get those floaters to go away. I've seen them go away within less than a week. Hmm. What are they really, those floaters? What are just toxic stuff floating around? Nobody's ever asked, and I've never asked. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't know what they are, but I know they will go away if you balance the chemistry uh, as well as getting rid of mercury. I suppose other things other than mercury would do it, but I have never seen yeah. anything except mercury create those. I had some years ago, Doc, and and they just have gone away over the years. I don't know why. They just don't say, who knows? Um, doctor, another question. When did they start using mercury fillings for dentistry? And during that period till now, was there a decade when it was most toxic regarding the mixture of, say, mercury, silver, copper, etc.? like during the 50s, 60s, or 80s, huh? Hmm. Oh, that's a long question. Yeah. Uh, let's see if I can remember all of it. When was it first used? It was first used in 1832 in Paris, France. 1830. In interesting that the first case of multiple sclerosis was, dis was described in tremendous detail, exactly as you would today, in 1832. Really? In Paris, France. Hmm. And leukemia, you can trace its origin back to 1832. A number of diseases were traced back to that time. Now, yeah, they had a mixture that uh, was not real good. I mean, when I was in dental school, it was 60% mercury, 40% the other metals. The mercury came out of that pretty fast. Then in getting closer to 50-50, it was a little better. And then in 1976, the Dental Association paid for and patented what's called the high copper amalgam. And the high copper amalgam contains 30-some percent copper instead of the 3 to 5 percent it used to, 
and the mercury comes out 50 times faster, Whoa. five zero. Wow. So one amalgam filling today gives you the same amount of mercury as 50 fillings would have in 1975. Hmm. And excess copper in the body is a problem as well, right? Well, yes. Copper yeah. is almost as toxic as mercury, so we might as well mix them together. Maybe they cancel each other out. <laughs> I'm a 59-year-old female, writes Joyce. I have very low cholesterol. My is 109. Uh, H- yes, that is very low cholesterol. HDL 62, LDL is 37. Are there health risks to this? I had my gallbladder removed from stones in my early 20s. Dr. Huggins have suggestions for me regarding diet. Oh, diet, you'd have to look at the whole rest of the chemistry. You know, supposedly you eat an egg and your cholesterol is going to go up. Well, if you eat nothing but eggs, as we have one dentist who did, female type, for 30 days, she had a high cholesterol. It was up in the 300s, and it dropped 100 points during that time, eating nothing but eggs. So if we want to drop a high cholesterol, we give people two eggs a day and a quarter of a pound of butter a day. That brings down the high cholesterol. That's pretty easy. Bringing a low cholesterol up, uh, that is difficult. That gets real picky. That looks at the CBC, the hair analysis, the uh, person's lifestyle, because if you exercise, you're burning up cholesterol. Getting a low cholesterol to come up is a real problem. Hmm. be done, but you've got to look at a lot of different areas. Here's an email from Lynn. I had a dental abscess in this lower left bicuspid two years ago, diagnosed with x-ray, the dentist wanted to do a root canal or extract the tooth, but I took Le- Levaquin, L-E-V-A-Q-U-I-N, and something else and used natural remedies, and it healed. But now I have pain in the area again. I haven't seen the dentist about it. Um, but we were talking about a while ago that when it looks fine on the x-ray, it may not be fine because those are the ones that had the highest bacterial count. So we may have... Uh, cut out. If you take enough antibiotic in particular, it's going to stop the immune activity in that area so pain goes away. But once those areas are infected, uh, I have not seen anything that got rid of the infection. We don't have very many, but maybe two or three teeth that would have the same uh, background as what this person is describing. And they were still full of bacteria down there. Uh, Here's where you can find out. You can do that test we were talking about earlier where you you take the little uh, point and uh, bite down on the popsicle stick for 60 seconds, chew on it for 60 seconds, and if there's any infection down at the bottom, it comes right up. If nothing comes up, if there's no infection, hey, you created a healing. So that would be one way to find out. Lynn also goes on, I had one bicuspid tooth removed from each quadrant 47 years ago as a prerequisite to starting orthodontist, which moved my teeth to fill the gaps. Is it possible I have a cavitation where these bicuspids were removed? Yes. Uh, Where bicuspids are removed for orthodontics, uh, it depends on the type of orthodontics it was done, but overall, in looking at large numbers of them, 35% become cavitations. So that means that if you've had four out, you've got at least one cavitation, maybe more. Joe from Los Angeles writes, well, what does Dr. Huggins think about laser dentistry? Is it safe? Oh, uh, Laser surgery, I know a little bit about. In, in taking out implants, laser surgery is wonderful. Uh, for removing decay and things like that, I have no experience there. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Uh, Amy writes, I had my one, two, and three teeth, back teeth on the upper right side, removed from an infection from a root canal. What would be the best option to have done to get somewhat of a normal function for chewing? Yeah, it would be the removable partial made yeah. out of clear acrylic, not made out of the pink stuff. Also, she asked them, um, yeah, people are talking about stem cells to regrow missing teeth. Is there any updates on that from Dr. Huggins? Mm, not from Dr. Huggins. Uh, the biggest problem they've had with that is you never know which tooth is going to show up. You know, you might have a wisdom tooth show up in the front of your mouth. Oh, that's not too great. <laughs> okay. 
a couple more here. If a person is advised to have a root canal and opts out of that, then what are his options if if the tooth needs to be removed? Who? Oh. Yeah. Uh, okay, okay, just got to take the tooth out, right? Yeah, taking it one at a time. There's one thing in uh, patient empowerment that I quote, and that's Nancy Reagan. Uh, I thought it was the stupidest thing I ever heard when I first heard it. They said, what would you tell people, Hmm. the teenagers, when they are offered drugs? And her answer was, just say no. Just say no. And I thought, boy, that's not going to do anything. I have picked that up, and it's at the end of every chapter now in uh, patient empowerment. If somebody wants to put a root canal in your mouth, just say no. You might include in that and run. (laughs) You don't want to be around someplace that's going to put a root canal in you. But what do you replace? Yeah, take the tooth out. Make sure the periodontal ligament is removed. Um, you can have a bridge put in or a removable partial. And this is something that dentists, I have not heard of a dentist yet in the last three years who have told somebody, you have an option of implant, removable, uh, partial, or um, bridge. I have not heard one of the people that who talked to me they were told you can have an implant, that's all that can be done. They were not told about bridges, they were not told about partials, and those have been in dentistry for well over 100 years. Charles, but, Charles writes on the same uh, line of thinking, Doc, can an implant be reversed, removed? Yes, and boy, is that a pain in the neck. Boy, is it. Where I like the, uh, the laser because it does a whole lot less damage to the bone. But, man, you got to get in there and do a bunch of balancing of the chemistry or that patient's going to have a real miserable time before they die. Could you please ask Dr. Huggins what he thinks of adding xylitol from birch trees in drinks or food for sweetenings? Uh, it is better than sucrose. It does not uh, interfere with the... Uh, blood sugar level as much as uh, as sucrose, your table sugar, does. This lady's in Europe. She says, what do people in Europe and worldwide do about the salt if they can't get the pickling and canning? Hmm. Yeah, well... Um, <laughs> That's tough, isn't it? A bunch of them have us send it to them. <laughs> so it can, it can happen. Uh, I mean, some people want it sent, uh, you know, overnight. Well, you don't have to do that. But a <laughs> four-pound box is still going to cost 30 40 bucks to have it shipped or get more. And, it, you know, the more you get, the less it costs for shipping. Mm-hmm. Get some friends to do it. But um, I don't have any information on where to get it in Europe. But, you know, if enough people ask a question, and this question's come up several times on this program, uh, if enough people ask, uh, I go out and start looking. So um, sure. I have a couple of people here who love to do research, and that's the kind of research that is practical that people need. So, I, well, why don't you call Morton's and ask them? Yeah, yeah. Where I would start, ask Morton's who in Europe does this. Well, Doc, a final question, then we're going to let you go have lunch. Um, it, there's several emails, two, three, four that say, how do I find a dentist? You know, the obvious question, how do I find a dentist that uh, knows what they're doing? What, what's your gen- What's the best answer you got? Uh, we do have a list of people who have trained with me. And if they'll call the 866-948-4638, we'll try to match you with somebody in your area. Uh, but there are a lot of people who say they were trained by Huggins because... They listened to maybe a program by Pat Timponi, hmm. and they heard Huggins talk for 15 minutes, and so now <laughs> no, they're, they're, everything knows. <laughs> they're Huggins trained. Oh, that's great. Well, I, 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 think it, I think it's so important that even if people have to travel, I know people come in to travel to see Dr. Nunley, you know, here in Marble Falls and other places. It's worth the trip to really find somebody good, isn't it? Oh, yeah. Yeah, because... Well, it depends. If you've just got a year to live, what difference does it make? But, guys, you know, some people have a life expectancy of another five to ten years. Well, if you've got that, you might as well be in good health while you're doing that, mm-hmm. not up with the stuff that these dental materials will do to you. This question came up, and uh, this may not be 
you may be talking out of school. I don't know if you can say, but can you tell us how quickly how you work with Dr. Nunley to get rid of all his mercury, or should I just ask him? Uh, well, he had uh, he has a good friend there, Dickie Stanley, mm-hmm. and he does all the things that we do. He's also in Marble Falls. Uh, he had heard me speak, and he told um, um, <clears throat> told Nunley to give me a call. Can you hold for five seconds? I'll sure, be right. no problem. Well, we're, we're going to wrap it up here in just a minute. Uh, uh, please pass on this podcast to everyone that you care about. We have Andy Goss coming up tomorrow at um, um, 9 o'clock Central Time. I want to thank to Sharon and to, uh, for all of her work and all of her help. But we'll wrap it up with Dr. Nunley uh, and Dr. Huggins here after this, uh, uh, I think, critical question about this, uh, getting rid of all the mercury, because Dr. Uh, Nunley was pretty filled up. Yeah, well, he told, uh, uh, he told Nunley to call me. Well, at that time, we were seeing people up in Canada, and um, I said, he called, I was leaving in about three days to go up and see about 25 people up there. Mm-hmm. And um, he said, you know, we don't know each other, but I've just been diagnosed with uh, potential ALS and uh, don't like what the future holds. ALS? Yeah. said, uh, what can I do? And I said, well, <laughs> briefly, <laughs> uh, with something like that, what I would do would be to call quick and get an airline uh, ticket to this place in Canada, and I'll see you up there in three days. And that's exactly what he did. Wow. A little conversation. It was talk about doing it on faith. He was really doing it on faith. So he did come up, and it was kind of funny. Uh, I was uh, walking to the hotel uh, with a friend of mine, and in front of us was a couple where he was hanging on to his wife like he was about to fall down. And um, I laughed, and I said, well... He's either dead drunk or a patient of mine. <laughs> it was Stuart Nunley. Oh, uh, and how long ago was this? He, when he got there, he could not carry a suitcase. He could not walk, had to have a wheelchair, and uh, he was up there two weeks, and when he left, he carried his own suitcase and did not have a uh, wheelchair. Wow, and what did you do in those two weeks? Uh, mainly, his problem was cavitations. Uh-huh. He didn't have any root canals, and I don't think he had any amalgam, so it was all cavitation related. But didn't he have, oh, I, I understood he had really heavy mercury as well. Maybe I was misinformed. Well, yes, he was a dentist, so he was taking a mm-hmm. bath of mercury every day. So he had, he did not have mercury fillings in his body, but his body, in his mouth, but his body was saturated with wow. mercury. And how'd you get that out? Uh a whole series of things. Uh, I've got a whole booklet on detoxification, mm-hmm. it's like 60 pages long. There are a lot of things that will detoxify. And, uh, you know, one of the best is uh, the far-infrared sauna. Well, how many people have a far-infrared sauna in their house? So there are other things that you can do, and that's what you need to do is find out a lot of things work, but... You have to be very careful with detoxification because, here's a very important quote, detoxification is retoxification. So anytime you detoxify, that mercury is going through your bloodstream, and if you don't direct it out, it's going to go someplace you didn't want it to go. Mm-hmm. Well, so why, de- why does it come out of the skin? Is it in just the fat and, you know, with the sweating and the far red for red? Is, it just, is that where it is, too? Well, yeah, sweating is one of the best ways because it bypasses the liver and kidney. Liver and kidney get real tired of detoxing. The kidney in particular does a lot of it, and the little tubules in there are real tiny, and mercury gets caught in there. And uh, it's easier to get stuff out of the brain than it is out of the kidney. So it's... Yeah, detoxification yeah. is retoxification, and be darn careful to what you do. Uh, I want to add this before we go, Doctor. Have you are, are you familiar with Doctor. Dottis Karazian? Karazian. I don't think so. Okay, he wrote a book on uh, thyroid. Um, why are my thyroid symptoms still going on when my when my tests are normal? 
really smart cookie up in uh, Washington. I think you'd enjoy his work. He's got a new book on the brain. He was on the air a few weeks ago. Here's what he said. I wanted to get your opinion. And I, he said that there are many people that get uh, their, their immune system get crazy over these heavy metals. I think you alluded to this early, right? You get this autoimmune thing going with the heavy metals. And, yeah. and these kinds of people, he said on the show, is that if they go in and start doing chelation, like DMPS, DMSA, EDTA, to get rid of these metals, that it will end up in the brain. Yeah. Because Do you think he's it, right? What you're doing is transferring just because you have, that's why detoxification is so important. Just because you take uh, mercury out of your arm bone and stick it in your brain does not mean you helped anything. Uh. Detoxification is retoxification, and most of it is too fast. I mean, DMPS messes up the uh, kidney. Uh. Uh, DMSA, I really like that at 25 milligrams Monday, Wednesday, Friday. But they'll give you two 500 milligram capsules in one day. And what does that do? That just saturates the brain and every place else that doesn't need it. Releasing mercury is easy. Excreting it is limited. There's only a certain speed the liver and kidney can work. Hmm. Just because you flood the area with mercury does not mean that you have gotten rid of it. You're just transporting it someplace else. And that's why the sweating, the sauna, the far infrared sauna, and these are so good because you don't have to fuss with the bloodstream, the kidney, and the liver. Uh, sweating is an entirely different mechanism, and it gets rid of a lot of this stuff. You told me the other day, hope I'm not getting too personal, but you and you do coffee enemas quite often. Why is that? <clears throat> well, I got acquainted with <laughs> Charlotte Gerson some time back, and I uh, used to fuss with her about these things. <laughs> Because, you know, she's into vegetarianism and I'm a carnivore and so on. But we have uh, kissed and made up, and uh, she's 91 years old now. Oh, yeah. And uh, we've had a real good time together. But it is another method of detoxification. And I can't talk about these things to people a whole lot unless I've experienced it. Yeah. So, yeah, I have experienced it. And uh, <laughs> I call it the coffee break. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so are, are there actually the metals, the mercury dock and, and copper and stuff right in that liver, or uh, a lot of other things are going on? A lot of other things are going on. Uh, originally, uh, Gerson's uh, father developed this for uh, cancer, and he got the idea from First World War and Second World War when uh, people were injured. They had enough uh, pain medication to do the surgery, but not for follow-up. And so they used coffee enemas uh, for follow-up and took care of a lot of the pain. Mm -hmm. Well, how does it do that? Well, it gets rid of some of the uh, weird toxins that end up in the liver. Oh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And so I said, you know, there's no way that, you know, if, if I drink coffee, I know what's going to happen to my triglyceride. It's going to skyrocket. So, you know, a coffee enema... <laughs> uh, it's going to really be dangerous. All right, prove it. So I took coffee enemas and did triglycerides, and it does not elevate the cholesterol, the triglycerides, <clears throat> the calcium, the things that you don't want. The, if you drink coffee, you got a whole lot of things in the body, chemists in the blood, that are going to go the wrong direction. But if you do that coffee enema, that doesn't happen. So I was wrong. You're not absorbing the uh, coffee from the, the caffeine from the intestinal tract. But I had to go through the experience myself in order to prove it. And I did it, and uh, I was wrong. Mm -hmm. So I'll admit, it does not mess up the chemistry. So overall, though, this chelation, like we know it with the IVs, can be very dangerous if you don't know what one is doing, huh? Absolutely, yeah. because as Boyd Haley pointed out, which and I was at the meeting in 1983, the ACAM group, American College for the Advancement of Medicine, when he presented that if you uh, put uh, EDTA into the body, it's going to have a high affinity for mercury and become the same thing as thimerosal, wow. which does a lot of nerve damage. Well, that is 
It's probably not going to happen. Oh, it might. Okay. Okay. Tell them we're almost done. We're going to let you go in a second. uh, A DNA. Find out what what it's about. If that's a DNA, I need the DNA. He's always working. He's always working, this guy. I was just telling my audience that you're always working. Sorry, I'm back. No, not sorry. I was just telling my audience that you're always working. In fact, I have a call coming in from Dr. Nunley in 15 minutes. Okay. I wanted to know if yeah, I was we'll, ready for Yeah, we're, 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 we're almost done. But um, uh, uh, let's see, where did we leave off? Uh, boom. Talking about DMSA. Yeah, now, DMSA, right. right. EDTA. Uh, EDTA, now I've got very mixed feelings on that because there's a friend of mine's an MD in New Zealand, and he has saved a lot of diabetics from having their leg cut off oh. by using uh, EDTA chelation. Sure, sure. Of getting the calcium out. Now, he does things a little differently, and he balances out some chemistry before he uses it. Mm-hmm. So this may be why there's such a difference in there. Yeah. yeah, uh, yeah. But most people, it uh, has a, well, it has an option of doing good and doing harm. You just have to... Watch the chemistries, watch the patient, and be real careful. It is not the end-all, be-all savior. Well, Dr. Huckins, thanks so much, uh, brother, for spending all this time with us. I know that you've helped a lot of people with this, and this podcast will go viral because people just pass them all over the world. So, um, so I've I hope- noticed that. We get telephone calls from all over. And That's great. Wow. I tell you, I have been interviewed uh, close to 2,000 times now, and... I will not hesitate to say you are my favorite as as far as a person to interview me. Uh, you're my favorite. It used to well, be Bob Atkins. He and well, I used to really have a good time together, and you have taken his place now. So well, I got, really enjoy it because we cover a lot of things. At my advanced age, yeah, I would yeah, yeah. to be pretty tired by now, but well, I'm all fired up because well, Doc, you've kept me that way. You've got great taste. I just got to tell you that. So thanks so much. Can you just hold on one sec because I, I got to tie up something with you off the air? Okay. Okay, stay right there. Thank you, sir. See you real soon. You take care of yourself, okay? I'll make a note of it. Okay, hold on. Stay there. Broadcasting worldwide from the beautiful hill country in Texas, this is OneRadioNetwork.com.